thermochemistry. So this unit is all about heat, right? And the heat that is released or absorbed when chemical reactions take place. So really before we can do anything, I guess gotta make sure everybody's on equal footing with their understanding of terms. A lot of these terms you may have seen before, some of them you haven't, and that's okay. So let's go over them. So first and foremost, you need to know what temperature is. All right, it's a measure of the average kinetic energy of particles. All right, so understand that anytime you have a sample of a substance, the easiest one to relate to is a liquid. All right, if you've got a sample of a liquid, you understand that particles are moving around, right, because that's what liquids do. The particles are free-flowing. And you understand that some are moving faster than others, All right? And that's okay. There's just a distribution of speeds. If I were to write a little chart here, and on the y-axis, I had the number, and on the x-axis, I wrote kinetic energy. The distribution of particles would look something like this. Right? You've got some that are, some that are fast, you got some that are slow, and of course here's the average. So just know that in any sample there's going to be a range. All right, they don't all literally move with the same amount of energy. Okay? So temperature measures the average kinetic energy. And of course we're gonna be measuring in uh, Celsius or Kelvin, pr primarily Celsius here, all right? So if there ever is a temperature in Fahrenheit, all right, so Fahrenheit, 9 fifths Celsius plus 32. You would have to convert into Celsius. So Fahrenheit minus 32 multiplied by 5 ninths. Okay. All right, so that's temperature. Heat. Heat is energy that is transferred from one substance to another. All right. Uh, heat energy that is transferred is transferred from hotter objects to colder objects. So heat flows downhill. That's just how thermodynamics works, right? You will not you cannot burn yourself with an ice cube. Well, actually you can. Sorry, wait, let me get that bad example. Uh, you, you will not freeze um, a popsicle with fire, right? It always, heat always goes from the hotter object to the cooler object, always, okay? So the difference between heat and temperature is temperature will change depending on whether heat was gained or lost. So the relationship between these two, if you want to think of temperature as like your, your checking account, and a heat is like a check that is written. So the balance on your checking account will go up if heat is received, right? But if you write a check, the balance in your checking account will go down. Does that make sense? Temperature is a reflection of how much energy there is, and energy can be gained or lost because of heat. Heat can be gained or lost. Okay? You boil a beaker of water, you've got to put energy into it. You freeze uh, an ice cube, you freeze water into an ice cube, you're taking energy away from it. Okay? So, the term calorimetry is just generically the science of measuring heat, and that's what this unit is all about. Right, calorimetry. Now, uh, calorimetry is a subset of what we call thermodynamics. We actually will cover a small portion of thermodynamics in this unit, but in this unit, we're not going to call it thermodynamics. We're just going to call it calorimetry. Thermodynamics is actually our last unit of the year, and then we will tie back a lot of the themes and concepts from this unit then. All right, so. All right, definition of energy. Energy is the capacity to do work or cause heat transfer specific to this unit. 
Now, in physics last year, you guys talked a lot about potential energy and kinetic energy, especially with kinematics, right? Uh, projectiles falling, right? Moving from left to right, you know, calculating the energy of how, based on its velocity, based on acceleration. So we are not so much concerned with kinematic energy in this class, although you should recognize this as your unit of energy from physics, the joule. Recall that joule is a kilograms meter squared per second squared. And the reason why I'm showing you in this form is so that you can relate because later on we're going to be calculating energy from those units into joules. So that's just something you, you should know, okay, what a joule, where the basis of a joule comes from. Now, more relatable, especially with like food sciences, is the calorie. A calorie is 4.184 joules, right? And so uh, another term that you should know. If a calorie is 4.184 joules, a kilocalorie, well, that would be 1,000 calories. That makes sense, right? So a kilocalorie in the industry is known as a food calorie. And the difference is that uh, a food calorie is sometimes written as a capital C, capital calorie versus lowercase calorie. This is a chemistry calorie. This is a food calorie. So on a Snickers bar, if it says that there are 240 calories in, you know, on Snickers bar, notice that the C is capital, all right? So there's actually 240,000 calories because it's chemistry, if we convert it to chemistry calories, lowercase, it's, it's you multiply by 1,000, okay? So all the calories that you have known all of your lives as you've been reading labels is actually uh, 1,000 times more than a regular chemistry calorie. It's just no big deal, but just know that you have to convert, right? A kilocalorie is a food calorie. And you'll have to go back and forth. Okay, so potential energy right? Mass times gravity times height is one way for calculating potential energy in physics. Uh, another way to calculate potential energy is through quant or through uh, Coulomb's law. And Coulomb's law is based on charges and distance. Distance between the charged bodies. So whenever we cite Coulomb's law, this is a situation where you have two things that have charge and they are some proximate distance to each other. All right. Now, um, in a situation where you need to calculate which one of these is going to be more influential, notice that this is inverse square. Right? Notice the fact that we are dividing by distance squared, right? which means uh, if you take two charged bodies and if they're one foot apart, but then if you place them two feet apart, the effect on their energy is actually one quarter because of inverse square. Right? So if they are now four feet apart, their energy of interactions is actually one sixteenth of, of what it was. Does that make sense? Okay, inverse square. Okay. All right, so these are energy terms that are going to be thrown around that you might need to relate to. So you may want to kind of refer back to the section of notes as we work through problems, okay? Kinetic energy is the energy of action or energy of motion, right? And heat is like energy of motion. Um, if this were a single body, we could calculate the kinetic energy using this equation, one-half mv squared, right? Whereas m is the mass, right? And v is velocity in meters per second. And the mass would be measured in kilograms. So hopefully that makes sense because if we look at our joules, meters per second squared, kilograms, here's kilograms. The mass is kilograms, right? So this unit is derived from calculating energy this way, okay? All right, then 
in this unit, you're going to see two types of reactions. Exothermic. So the Latin prefix exo means out. So really, a reaction which liberates heat releases energy. And you will see next to a reaction, okay, so for example, A plus B forms C. Next to this reaction, you will see a delta H value, and that delta H value, if it's exothermic, will be negative. Negative sign, because the negative is relative to the reaction, so heat is released, okay? Signs are very important in this unit, right? You will see, you will think that the, the amount of points I take off is rather disproportionate because it's just a silly little sign after all, but it means so much. The sign is very important, okay? So always pay attention to the sign. And then reactions can be endothermic, which means they absorb heat energy. So you might have D become D liquid, and the delta H for it would be a positive value. Which means heat is absorbed. Another way of thinking of that is that heat is necessary for the reaction to occur. or heat as a reactant. Whereas above exothermic, heat would be a product. Okay, so are you guys solid on these two terms? Endothermic or exothermic? Heat is released. So any reaction that you've seen in lab where the beaker or the test tube feels warmer, that's because the reactants are releasing heat to the environment and you are part of the environment. You interpret that extra heat, that warmth, you know, as, as increase in temperature, it's because the reaction is releasing energy to you. Some reactions, although not as many that you've seen before, but some reactions require energy. And so the result is that it would feel cold to touch. Because when you touch an endothermic reaction, that reaction is pulling heat in from the environment and you are part of the environment so it feels cold to you okay uh ice packs right on the football field like let's say you if you, you you need an ice pack and so the medic comes and they take a pat a bag and they they hit it what they're doing is they're breaking the compartments between chemicals in that pack and then they mix and when they mix it's an endothermic reaction which it pulls in heat from the environment and so it feels cold so you take that cold ice pack and you put it on you know your knee or whatever and then it you know, prevents inflammation. Okay. Signs are important. Okay. Uh, let's dig a little deeper. Let's talk about the concept of internal energy. So first, the law of conservation of energy says that energy can be converted, converted from one form to another but it cannot be created nor destroyed. Okay, so if I have a stapler teetering on the edge of my desk here, I mean, it's not obvious, but there is energy. What is that energy in the form of? Potential. Potential. And if I just nudge it, that potential energy is converted. It's converted to kinetic energy as it falls. And once it impacts the ground, that, that kinetic energy of motion is converted to energy of sound. All energy is accounted for. It's all changed from some, one form into something else, right? But energy just doesn't disappear. Now, it's easy to think that energy might disappear, but probably what's really happening is the energy is dissipating, okay? You got a, a hot mug of coffee, 
the energy that's in that mug of coffee just slowly, eventually dissipates into the air. So the airspace around that mug of coffee is actually warming up, right? You ever sit in a small space with a lot of people, right? With, with not much ventilation, what happens? It gets hot. So a uh, prime example, in whenever school, the start of the school year, right? The start of the school year, uh, this room, you know, even if they turn the air conditioning on, when 30 bodies come in here and sit here for 80 minutes, the temperature changes like five or six degrees because of all the body heat that's being radiated out into the airspace, right? At the end of the day, it's like a sauna in here just because uh, all your, you guys are bringing out, you're burning all your calories, you're radiating heat, right? So, okay. Energy cannot be created nor destroyed. Did I break my stapler? I was broken. All right, it was for science, it's okay. Okay, so this is known as the first, 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 first. Law, 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 of, of, of. Thermodynamics, dynamics, dynamics. Sometimes it's interpreted as the energy of the universe is constant. There's, I'm, I'm kind of oversimplifying it here. Uh, technically, in thermodynamics, there's way more parameters that need to be explained, but those are outside the scope of this unit. All right, so right now, you just need to know that. Simple. Law of conservation of energy. Energy is not created nor destroyed. Okay, so the internal energy of a system. Let's stop here for a second. System, what's a system? In our context, the system is the reaction. Okay, the reaction, which means, which means reactants and products. Okay, so whenever I say system, that is what I mean. I mean all of the reactants and all of the products. So the internal energy of a system, of a reaction, is the sum of its kinetic and potential energies of all of the particles present. Kinetic and potential, okay? Now, the internal energy can be changed. It can be changed by these factors, heat or work or both of them. Oh, hey, look, I defined system right here. Okay. So the system is what is doing something, i.e. the reaction. Surroundings would be everything else. Okay. So if your reactants are mixed in a solution and the reaction is taking place in solution, the water, the solvent, the water is not one of the reactants or products. The water is the environment, the surroundings. The beaker is the surroundings. The lab bench is the surroundings. Your hand is the surroundings. Okay, literally the only, the system is the reactants and the products, like literally, okay? So, know what we're talking about so guess what there's an equation internal energy can be calculated and adjusted for change so the change in the internal energy is simply the sum of the heat which here we need to mention heat is represented as q the letter q capital and w is work Okay, so work, what, like a job? Like working at McDonald's? What do we mean work? So uh, when a, whenever something happens, oh, I guess here we're talking about Q first. Okay, so the sign of Q is with respect to the system, and we just addressed these terms, endothermic or exothermic. You know that it, if heat is being absorbed, that is heat gain, right? Gain, heat gain is heat being absorbed. Heat loss, well, is, is heat released. So the signs are the same signs we just addressed. Positive for gain, negative for loss. So. If the value of Q for reaction is positive, then your Q is positive. If the value for, if it's exothermic, then the value for Q is negative, okay? 
let's talk a little bit about work because this, this may be a little abstract. So the definition of work is force over a distance. Right, so we can calculate force over distance. Now, this was also kinematics and physics, so we're not going to go too deep into this. But uh, in the case of chemistry, the typical places where we see work take place are with gases. So let's talk about gases for a second. Let's say that I have a chamber, a piston chamber, right, and there's a, there's a gas in here. As you know with gases, the gas particles are constantly moving, right, and bouncing off the walls. We actually have a unit on gases that we're going to talk about later, but you should remember a little bit, enough of this from sophomore year for this to make sense. With a gas, particles are always bouncing around. So because gases, because gases have a lot of space in between them, the only way for a gas to maintain its same volume is if it's constantly having collisions with its container walls. Okay, imagine you took a two-liter bottle that was empty, just the two-liter bottle was empty, and you put the cap on, tighten the cap tightly. What's inside that two-liter bottle? Air. Can you take that two-liter bottle and squeeze it to a smaller shape? Maybe. You've got to be really strong to do that, right? Because what the air is resisting you pushing inward on it, right? Okay. Or here's another thing. Um, when you pump a tire filled with air from a pump, right? If the, tire start, if the tire is empty and you hook up that pump and you start pushing it, it's kind of easy at first, right? But what happens? It's it harder. Why is it getting harder? I've pumped this now 20 times. All of a sudden, I can't pump it as easily as I did before. Why? There's resistance. There's more, the more gas that's there, the more resistance there is, right? And the resistance, because the more particles, more particles means more pressure. So if I have a piston system like this, and if I push down on the plunger, we're compressing it, right? This is work done on the gas. Work done on the gas, that work is absorbed by the gas, so this would be a positive W for the gas. Work done on the gas is positive W. Okay, well, what is the counter example of that? Well, so let's say that um, let's say that we release the pressure on the piston or I should say release the force the gases push upward. Gas pushes against container. Work is a negative value. The gas is doing work. When gases expand, they are doing work. The sign of work for the gases would then be negative. So, positive, work is done on the system. So when you compress the gas, you're doing work on the system. The sign for work is positive. If the work is doing system, or if the gas is doing work, like if the gas is pushing something, then the gas is doing the work, the sign is negative. So, we need to take both heat and work into account to solve for what delta E is. So the change in internal energy is the sum of heat and work. So, 
Let's look at this example here. Calculate the delta E if 47 kilojoules of heat energy is dissipated by a system. Dissipated. Okay. If energy is dissipated, the system is dissipating energy outward, is the sign positive or negative? It would be negative. And 88 kilojoules of work are done on the system. So this system, something's pushing down on this system. Is that positive or negative for the work? It's positive. So just put the signs in the right places. So the delta E is going to be negative 47 plus a positive 88. And I use extra parentheses here to just for complete separation to show what the charges are. So what is the net change of internal energy for this system? 41. Mm -hmm. Okay, try the second one yourself. So we want to find Q. They gave us the change of the internal energy. So you know we have 35 kilojoules is equal to Q plus whatever work is. And so it says that the work, this does 65 kilojoules of work. So what sign do I use? Yeah, the system is doing the work. Okay. So to solve for Q, well, you just solve algebraically solve for Q. All right, add 65 to both sides. So 100 kilojoules is equal to Q. All right, you guys okay with internal energy, heat, and work? Okay. All right, so the main topic of today is heat flow. So you know how heat and work work in context to determine overall internal energy. But now we're just going to focus on heat flow on Q. So a couple of, of new terms. Heat capacity is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of a given amount of substance by one degree. All right, one degree per degree Celsius. Okay, so heat capacity amount of energy, it's joules per degree Celsius. It does not depend on an amount, right? So this is an extrinsic property. So simply put, let's say I have a cup, a styrofoam cup of water, all right? And it's at room temperature. So let's just say 20 degrees Celsius. And let's say I want to heat it up to... Uh, 24 degrees Celsius. Does that seem like a reasonable thing I could do? Sure. Just pop it in the microwave for like 10 seconds, right? That's pretty easy to do, okay? Let's consider... Let's consider... Consider an ocean. Let's say I wanted to change the temperature of the ocean from 20 degrees to 24 degrees. 
Would that be easy to do? Why not? Water is easy to change the temperature of. Look how easy it was for me to change the temperature of that cup of water. Why can't I do that to the ocean? Oh, there's so much more of it. Which of these two has the greater heat capacity? Mm, no, they don't. The ocean has a tremendously greater amount of energy that's required to change its temperature per degree, right? So heat capacity in and of itself changes depending on the amount. So what's probably more useful is an intrinsic value. If we did heat capacity per gram, all right, if it's per gram, that now gives us a ratio that's workable in any scenario. And that's what specific heat capacity is, right? The energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree. So in other words, C, which is the symbol for specific heat capacity, which is kind of odd because you think it'd be SHC, right? It's just shortened to C. It's joules per gram degree Celsius. So in other words, in other words, it's heat capacity per gram. Now, the heat capacity per gram, how does it compare between the water and the ocean? They, are the same. they will be the same. If I have one gram of that coffee cup water, versus one gram of ocean water, it would take the same energy to change it per degree. Does that make sense? Okay, so specific heat actually is actually more um, useful for what we're doing here. But I do need to explain what heat capacity is so you understand the difference, okay? All right, so the heat flow equation, Q is equal to MC delta T. People call this the MCAT equation which is actually erroneous because that delta is not an A, but whatever, you know, whatever helps you memorize it. So heat energy is Q, of course, right? The M is the mass, and we use the mass in grams. I know I mentioned kilograms earlier, but that was sort of a different formula, right? The kilograms was per joule because joules often measured with velocities in physics, but here it's just mass in grams. Specific heat capacity is the value C. Now, this is unique for every substance, okay? That's important to note. Unique for each substance. And things that are unique for each substance are useful to help identify them. And the, del the delta T... is the change in temperature. And of course, when you're talking about changes in chemistry, it's always the final state minus the initial state. And that is important for sine conversions, okay? Final temperature minus initial temperature. I should mention that the specific heat temperature unit can sometimes be in Kelvin. <coughs> And that doesn't throw anything off because if you're subtracting a Kelvin temperature from a Kelvin temperature, the difference is the same as if you subtracted a Celsius versus a Celsius. So don't be thrown if you see joules per gram degree Kelvin. It is the same thing, okay? All right. So then, let's say that 652 joules of energy are added to 15 grams of water and the water is originally at 20 degrees. Hmm, originally at 20 degrees. That sounds like an initial temperature to me. What is the final temperature? Oh, they're asking for final temperature. The specific heat of water is given here, 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. Okay, they want to find the final temperature. So Q, is equal to MC delta T, or Q over MC is equal to delta T. Let's find out what delta T is, and that'll allow us to find what the, the temperature was. We've got 652 joules. Our mass 
was 15 grams, our specific heat, 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. That's 52 divided by 15 divided by 4.18. And note your, uh, your unit cancellations here, right? So the joules and the joules cancel and the grams and the grams cancel. So now you have one over Celsius, which is in the denominator, which of course is going to be Celsius because fraction in the denominator is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. Uh, I got 10.4. The change in 10, that's not the answer. Okay, mind you, that's not the answer. 10.4 is the change in the temperature, right? So delta TF, 10.4 is equal to TI minus T, or I'm sorry, TF minus TI. And if they told us what TI was, that's how we figure out what our final temperature was. So TF is what? Yeah, 30.4. I guess you could have substituted delta T, you know, TF minus TI into, in place of delta C, either which way, it doesn't matter. I just did it in two steps. Now stop and think here. Does this make sense? What did they say was happening? Suppose 652 joules of energy is added to water. If you're going to add energy to anything, the temperature is going to go up. So it makes sense the final temperature was higher. Now, this is an overlooked check. This is a simple thing that you could do at the end of each problem to make sure that you, you have your sign convections written the right way. Okay? So, if you're adding energy, the temperature's got to go up. If, you're, if it's releasing energy, the temperature's going to go down. Okay? All right. So, let's try another sample. I've got a 50 gram piece of metal at 100 degrees Celsius. It's placed into a container of 100 milliliters of water. I don't know why that's capital OF, but whatever. Uh, at 24 degrees, the water temperature changes. You may assume that all the heat energy lost by the metal was absorbed by the water. Okay, so here's what's happening. I've got a piece of metal, which is hot, right? The piece of metal is 100 degrees Celsius, and it's got a mass of 50 grams. It is plunked into water. This, there's 100 milliliters of water. By the way, the density of water for the purposes of this unit is one gram per milliliter. So when I give you the volume of water, what am I really giving you? The mass, right? What I'm saying is it's 100 grams of water, okay? This water's temperature is 24 degrees. So if I take a hot piece of metal and put it in water, what do you anticipate is going to happen to the temperature of the water? It's going to go up. Okay, it's going to go up. So because we cannot take the temperature of the metal, like I cannot take a thermometer or temperature probe and jam it in a solid piece of metal. I can't do that. But I can measure the temperature of things that are around the metal, like water. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the temperature probe and measure how much the temperature of the water changes. And what we need to understand is that any energy lost by the metal is equal to the energy gained by the water, but it's just opposite in sign. If I give one of you $50, then for me, the value is negative 50, but for someone else, it's positive 50, okay? We are assuming a clean transfer. We're assuming no loss to the environment, okay? So this is an important concept here, equal but opposite. Energy loss is equal to the energy gain. It's just opposite in sign. So, 
we can start answering these questions. How many joules did the water absorb? Joules is heat energy. So they're asking for this, right? So the Q of the water is equal to the M of the water times the C of the water. And I'm using subscript details here now because we have two different substances, okay? So that we keep them straight. How many joules does the water absorb? So I need to know the mass of the water. Do I know that? Yes, yes I do. It's 100 grams. I need to know the specific heat of the water, and that's something that never changes. That's a constant. So that's the number you're going to be using over and over and, o and over again. Specific heat is 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. Okay. I need to know the temperature change for, of the water. It says at the beginning, we went from 24 to 28. So T final minus T initial. So that, that would be four degrees Celsius. All right, so let's calculate how much energy the water absorbed. One thousand six hundred seventy two joules. Okay. If that is how much energy the water has absorbed, how much energy was lost by the metal? The same amount. Which means, which means this, QM is equal to negative 1672. Right, the, the, term, the term lost implies direction. Okay, guys, so if you see the term lost, you should know it's negative. If you see the term gained, you should know it's positive, okay? So if we say it's lost, that then plus equal but opposite, as we mentioned before. So now the question is, what is the heat capacity of the metal? All right, so if Q of metal is equal to M metal, C metal, delta T metal, they're asking for heat capacity. We just rearrange this. Q of metal over the mass of the metal and the delta T of the metal is equal to the C of the metal. That's how we're going to solve this. Yeah, Ron. No, we do need the mass of the metal in order to calculate this. Right? We're trying to find the, speed, the heat capacity. So we need to find, we, we know the heat, that we know the Q of the metal, because we just found that. The mass of the metal was given earlier, and the temperature change of the metal needs to be factored in as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so Q of metal, it's right here. Mass of metal. How much did this metal piece weigh? 50 grams. Temperature change of the metal. Okay, be careful here. The temperature final minus the temperature initial. So in this situation, when this metal was placed in that beaker, the, the metal and the water eventually reach what we call thermal equilibrium. What that means is, okay, so at the beginning, what's giving heat, what's absorbing heat at the beginning? Once I plunk that metal in there, who's giving heat? The metal, okay? Whichever one is hotter continues to give heat, right? But eventually, eventually, can't you see it when the metal eventually reaches the same temperature as the water? Once the temperature and the water are the same temperature, Who's giving heat? They're both giving and receiving the same amount of heat. That's what we call thermal equilibrium, when, when it's reached the same temperature. So my point is, if they told us that the temperature final for the water was 28, then the temperature final for the metal is, is what? 28. OK. so. 28 minus, what was the original temperature of the metal? 100. Do you see how the negative sign is going to cancel? 
because 28 minus 100 is going to be negative 72. Okay, so let's calculate this. The specific heat of the metal is going to be 0 0.464 joules per gram degrees Celsius. You're not going to have negative specific heat values. You're not going to have negative masses. But you will have negative delta Ts and you will have negative Q values. Right? So you can't forget this, this important concept right here. Energy loss is equal but opposite to the energy gain. Whichever one is gaining, whichever one is losing, whichever one you assign the negative sign to doesn't really matter because at the end, the negatives should cancel. All right. How are we doing? It's a little bit of a lot, but the calculation is not as bad as it seems. So we're going to – let me just give you one problem, and we're going to see if you guys get through it, okay? All right. So I've got um, a f an expensive gold-plated Mario Amiibo. Actually, it's actually made out of gold. Okay. Ooh. So I've got, let's say it's made out of silver. Actually, I don't know what metal it is. Um, let's say he weighs uh, 30 grams. And I've been boiling him in hot water. And by putting him in the boiling water, that ensures that the temperature gets to 100 degrees Celsius. Because what temperature does water boil at? 100. And if I leave something in 100 degrees, it's eventually going to get to 100 degrees. Right? So... We'll mention this later, but, you know, your water temperature cannot get above 100 because if it does, it turns into gas, right? So if it gets hotter than 100, then it leaves. So that's why boiling water stays at 100. So anyway, so I've got this Mario figure. It's been – it's 100 degrees. And so I go ahead and I plunk it into Mr. Schramm's coffee. And, you know, the specific heat of coffee is basically the same as water. So we're just going to go with 4.18. Uh, we're going to say that there were about 250 milligrams of coffee. And the temperature initial was room temperature. So it was right about 20 degrees. All right. So this hot Mario plunked into his coffee cup causes the temperature to rise to 27.2 degrees Celsius. You know what? That mass of 30 grams doesn't seem high enough. I'm going to change that mass. I'm going to make it 300. It's a big boy. It like came with like a special like handle for a Wii mode or something. Okay. Find the specific heat of Mario.
you're basically following the same calculation steps as the example we just did. Specific heats of metals are pretty low. They're generally sub 1, right? Whereas water is 4.18. What value did we get? Yeah, that's what I got. So this is the premise for our lab tomorrow. You are going to be determining the specific heat of an, uh, of an unknown piece of metal by doing exactly this process. Okay? All right. That's as far as I wanted to get to today.